The history of music is filled with counterculture movements, and none of them gave the middle finger to society louder and angrier than punk. At its core, punk is rock and roll boiled down to its bare minimum. A few chords played downstroke fast and loud. It grew into an entire subculture with its own art, fashion, and attitude that scared the hell out of people and gave us characters like Johnny Rotten, Gigi Allen, Iggy Pop, and Jello Biafra. On today's Mohawk wearing Doc Martin stomping episode of Prisoners of Rock and Roll, we're going to take you through a brief history of punk music, starting with the garage rock that inspired it, up through the punk rock music of the 90s and beyond. And of course, we'll talk about the holy trinity of punk music, the Ramones, the Sex Pistols, and the Clash. Let's kick out the jams, inmates! What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Prisoners of Rock and Roll, Episode 9. I am your host, Bruce Ramon, and I am here with Ryan Ramon yeah. and Doug Ramon. Oi, oi, oi! <laughs> What's up, everybody? I'm Bruce Kramer. I'm with Ryan McCusker and Doug McCusker. We're going to be talking about the history of punk music tonight. This is a dangerous subject. This is. Maybe before we get started, we can say that this will be our first podcast as part of the Pantheon Network of Podcasts. Woo-hoo! Oh, right on. Rock Thanks on. for having us. We are super excited. Excited Pantheon Podcast is the premier network for music podcasts. They put out a lot of really cool shit. They're awesome. We're really excited to be a part of it. It's more pressure. That's yeah. all. Yeah, that's okay. That's all right. I think we're going to go through this one chronologically, and we'll make sure we, we pull over on the side of the road and we talk about some of the major players in the movement. The history of punk music is just filled with important bands, and we're not going to have time to touch on all yeah, of them. Dude, where are we going to start? Yeah, but where do uh, you start? We'll we'll talk about the key players, some memorable moments, and some. I think we got some nuggets that we all kind of uncovered in doing our research. Some mm-hmm. stuff that I I found some bands that I'd never even heard of before that I really really enjoyed listening to. Maybe before we dive into it, why don't we talk a little bit about some of the characteristics of punk music? Because totally. it really is more like a it is a lifestyle and an attitude. Sure, it's a fashion. Yeah, yeah. It's well, a, it became a fashion. It's a fashion. It's a way of life. It's a way of thinking. Yeah, and I think if you just say the word punk like in my mind i think of safety pins and sure. mohawks and doc yeah. martens and leather jackets and stuff like that yes yeah, the sears version of punk rock. <laughs> like, you know? yeah, yeah. sears had a whole line with bobby pins and, uh, and ripped t-shirts still you go there now they have them yeah, yeah. like hot topic and spencer's oh, and all that I, stuff yeah. 100 hours each yeah. but the thing with the hot topic maybe you go to hot topic and you, like the ramon shirts and the class shirts and sex pistol shirts they're all on the uh classic rock wall I, I went into Target one night and they had a Misfits shirt. And I was like, Punk's not dead. It just signed a great merchandising <laughs> yeah. deal with Target. <laughs> you know, it's, I get, you know, the music is, the songs tend to be short. The guitars are distorted. They're really fast. Power chords. They play a lot of stuff downstroke. And it's really not about the musicianship. I mean, even like no, the Ramones no, would no. be like, we stink. Yeah. yeah. They always said they stink. Like, why? Like, they got a record deal. Like, we stink. Like, Dude, it's all yeah. about the passion. And sure, it's, and it's again, it's another time where we're encountering music where it's about how it makes you feel and not how it sounds. You know, yeah. We talked yeah. about that a lot yeah. in other episodes. I think punk rock, in the definition, is a big F you. And F you if you can't understand it. And F you, don't tell me what I can and what I can't do. Like what I'm able to do. There's a lot of... um that that DIY attitude, like I'm going to do sure. it myself. And there's a couple times in this story where independent labels become really big. Mm-hmm. And also the, uh, I'm a punk and you're not. You're a poser. You're a sellout. You hear that, sh- <laughs> that comes God. up That's, all the time. Oh, my whole life. Yeah. The one-ups. Yeah, yeah, posers. You know? Also, I, I really interesting, weird stage names are a big part of punk music. Sure. And I know all kinds of musicians use everybody from Freddie Mercury to Lady Gaga, but you don't have musicians like Rat Scabies and <laughs> Sid Vicious and Johnny Rotten and Pat yeah. Smear in yeah. Yeah. pop music. Yeah. Or even like Joe Strummer. You know what I mean? Like Joe Strummer, he came up with the name because he strummed his guitar and he did it well. He played, started playing the uk- yeah, he played the ukulele. He grew up playing <laughs> u- he did it. His mom gave him a ukulele and uh, he that's how he became Joe Strummer. And a lot, the last note I have on what makes punk punk is also making fun of pop culture. Totally. Oh. Silly versions of pop or popular songs kind of become a, a big thing. Like, with yeah. The Ramones covered the Spider Man theme. Yeah. There's a couple other yeah. of those out through uh, the story. 
But I think that became, especially like in the 90s and all that, like that became like the big thing. Like we're going to make fun of everything. I said it before. If you're a true punk rocker, you're like the most closed minded person around. Because I, if it's not punk rock, then it doesn't matter. I agree with you on that. And that's a funny point because it's like, I'm so open minded that everything I think is right. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, you're wrong. That's exactly. How, that's how the punk rockers are. So why don't we go all the way back to the beginning of this? I mean, music is all connected. Punk rock really came out of garage rock, which was inspired by the British invasion. The Beatles go on the Ed Sullivan show, and thousands of people across America decide that they need to start their own rock and roll band. And the influence of that harder, edgier sound from the British invasion starts sneaking in. But again, it is another genre of music that we as Americans invented and London was kind of oh, on our tail. They ripped us off <laughs> again. Ripped yeah. us off. So, like, and and punk rock really started coming out of musicians who thought that mainstream rock and roll music was getting too commercial. Punk was something new because everything was getting dried up. Well, that's the definition of punk. Is punk is like something that nobody ever did before. Anything could have been punk. Like Lawrence Welk could have been punk at one time. Totally. You know I mean, and we've had a couple other times in other episodes where we've mentioned an artist and we've been like, man, that's really punk rock. Like sure. the attitude oh, that the yeah. artist yeah. took I, is really punk rock. You no, know, me and Doug have. Always be like, oh, that's punk rock. Mm-hmm. I guess it's, it means that like, it's awesome. Yeah, it's like an aggression. You know, like, oh, that's real punk. You know, the, like no, the we're, aggression. Even we're just behind the bar and somebody does something. It's like, yeah. oh, that's punk rock. Yeah. That's it, punk rock. And in my eternal acquisitive self, I started going down the rabbit hole of where the term punk rock came from. Mm-hmm. And it was like a little bit of debate around who was called punk rock first. Rolling Stone called the Guess Who punk rock in like 71. Really? Yeah. And then the music critic Dave Marsh, who also wrote four books about Bruce Springsteen, by the way, also used the term punk rock around the same time to describe Question Mark and the Mysterians, who wrote that song, 96 Tears. Totally, I never heard it. Yeah. Totally bizarre that Question Mark and the Mysterians and the Guess Who are the two places where punk rock is first uttered. Ryan, I think you had a, a really good example of a band where maybe we can trace all this back to. I don't know if it could be The Who or something else. I was thinking more like it could have been The Kinks. They have a, a great great song called all day and all the night and the progression is so it's it's so why don't we play a a little bit of it this song clip has been flagged by youtube as a potential copyright violation so enjoy this royalty free smooth jazz song instead you can hear the unedited version on your favorite podcast platform What a great song. You know, they were really influenced by the Kingsman, uh, Louie Louie. You know, we can go back, back and back and back of where punk rock really came from. The Davy Brothers were really influenced by American music. And I was just actually listening to that song when um, you guys were doing the uh, the movie soundtrack episode. And I heard Louie Louie and listening to your came out like, man, this is like really, really different. And I wonder what the influence of that song was to other acts and then the kinks came along and started really using that that aggressive sound it's really that distorted guitar that not a lot of other bands were doing everybody was getting to a trend let's get a little bit more crunchy yeah that crunchy is a great adjective and that winds up becoming like a signature sound of punk music moving forward and i love that you use them as an example because we were talking in our episode about sun in sun records about distorted guitar and how the the kinks were inspired by that Mm -hmm. and now it's taking it and moving it forward into punk music like dave davies he like sliced his amplifier with a razor blade and at that time i don't think a lot of people were really familiar with rocket 88 and all that you know, that distorted sound. And so, right, Dave Davies did that, and it, he just came up with that distortion that you heard, that uh, damaged amplifier. They sliced their, their speaker open mm-hmm. to give it more of a crunch. Right. People were even doing before that, like Link Rye did that with his Rumble song. He sliced his amplifier with a razor blade, and he got that sound out of there also. A lot of that early stuff, too. I, I watched a lot of YouTube videos on that um the early stuff, or they call it proto-punk or garage rock. And the, the, a lot of them are, they're wearing matching suits like the Beatles did. Yeah, you know, we're, we're a mm. long way from the leather jackets and the Mohawks became synonymous oh, with yeah. it years later. Very cool. I found a quote from Joe Strummer talking about the difference between this early stuff and the new stuff. Joe Strummer said the early stuff, pub rock, was, Hello, you bunch of drunks. I'm going to play these boogies, and I hope you like it. 
and then punk rock becomes here are tunes and we don't give a flying fuck whether you like them or not. In fact, we're going to play them even if you fucking hate them. We're going to play them louder and, and louder. Just, yeah, yeah. And there's the, yeah. that just that draws the line Darius. right there. Darius. Yeah. So we're going to move on here. Okay, so the next punk rockish thing that people consider is a song from the Velvet Underground, Waiting for My Man. It has a like a, a crunchy guitar riff in there. It, it gives it like a downstroke that's making it popular, the way that he's singing. And there's a change in there. I call it the punk rock chord change. I mean, you should play a little bit of yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Didn't the Velvet Underground start as in like an art project? Yeah, Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol started. So yeah. I was just always curious where Andy Warhol fell into that. You know? I don't know. Maybe it was the drugs. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Maybe it was like they wanted things to vibrate. Mm-hmm. You, you know what I mean. Yeah, no, I know like, what you mean. You, you want things to be so like loud. You want vibration. And that vibration from the amplifiers, like, oh, give me more of that. I want more of that. So Andy Warhol, like it, it was like it like an art experiment but wasn't Lou Reed like a bartender or something like that and yeah, he and could have been and he like he noticed him like how Andy Warhol would just notice like people and just see something in them I don't know I don't want to use the word exploit but like they were like a thing and not a yeah, band yeah, they had a right? model with yeah, that Nico. yeah Nico and they were she playing had, she could sing and they were playing at CBGB's they're associated in that whole genre yeah. they put that album out and they did another one like a year later uh, White Light White Heat which was, oh, was a great album. which is where I guess where social distortion got the idea for white yeah. light, white heat, white trash. And he's singing about like drugs and, and transvestites. New York right. City. Yeah, crappy yeah. New York and yeah. a lot which of Which I love. A lot crappy of New York themes. is the greatest. You love that saxophone sound yeah. associated uh, with New York. I just remember walking that. down the street. That second album has a song on it, Sister Ray, that is seventeen and a half minutes long. Sure. The Ramones first album is twenty nine minutes long. <laughs> so it's like where where we go with all this. Yeah, they they're a great important part of the story. We could do a whole episode on Velvet Underground. Oh, they're a great band. Doug, what do you know about the MC5? Well, the MC5 were a bunch of interesting characters, to they say were, the least. Dude. To say the least. I guess they would be the Rage Against the Machine of their time. Totally. They came out of Michigan, Park, Michigan, and they are considered one of the most important and influential hard rock, punk rock American bands of all time. They had a huge local following, drawing an audience of a thousand or more, even before they were even signed. And they would open for like Janis Joplin and what are they called? Big Brother. Big Brother and, and a Holding Company. And Holding, that's, I'm sorry, Holding Company. And they opened, also opened up for Cream. And they got blown off the, they blew Cream like right off the dude. stage. They actually cut their, uh, their set short. Dude, they were anarchists. They were, dude. I, I was looking at them this week. And they were trying to start a movement like the Black Panthers, and they were calling themselves the White Panthers. Well, well, there was a group that was associated with the Black Panthers. So, in the like in the sixties, and like the Black Panthers were, they were looking for more support or people of white color were. How could we support you? Well, become the White Panthers. Yeah. So what happened? They were sharing a house with the White Panthers. So there was a bombing of a CIA building, and they were sharing a house with the White Panthers. So they got brought in. Like nothing happened to them or anything like that. But they're they're a bunch of lunatics. They were anarchists, man. They were totally playing in Chicago during the riots. Like they were like the background soundtrack. They were like the band that was playing in the park when all the Chicagoans for the protest for the um, the, was it the Democratic Convention? Let's play a little bit bit of kick out the jams. This album was actually. Yeah. They are like one of the most important hard rock 
punk bands. Totally. And they, like nobody really knows of them. I think you got to be into music to yeah, understand. Yeah. You have to find them on your own. Yeah. Like I was uh during the quarantine I caught up on my friends episode cuz I have nothing to do. So in one episode Jennifer Aniston had an MC5 shirt on. Huh? And wow. I was like my niece was there. I was like, "Oh my gosh, you got the MC5 shirt." I'm like, "You don't even know what that is, but it's awesome." Oh. So like, who's, who's Mick 5? Yeah, yeah, who's Mick 5? So you know what she got me that Christmas? And that MC5 shirt. Oh, okay. I remember yeah. seeing you with yeah. that. I really want to say that they're one of the most influential rock and roll bands. And I am I kind of regret not putting them on my top six list. They really brought it. And they're from Detroit. All the Motor City, Motor City. Madman stuff that goes with it they were it and you hear a lot of the template of punk music in that song the yelling the sludgy guitars the really fast drums they're yelling at the they're crowd. kicking out the chance yeah. like they were like followed by police and the government yeah they were dangerous man i mean i i wish we had a band like that today they were a movement and the interesting thing is that they're one of two bands that are making this huge influence on punk music from detroit in 1969 a band called the Stooges with Iggy Pop. I keep on saying crunch, but I don't know what else to, to call it. In my room, I want you here. Now we're gonna be face to face. And I'll lay right down in my favorite place. That riff, you know, doing the research for the show, and I was listening to that song, and listening to these other songs that came out prior, nothing sounded like that. Nothing. It was dark. So it's funny, though, because like Ron Ashen, who plays guitar for Iggy and the Stooges, he went to London, and he saw the Who there, and he was just blown away. The explosion of the drums and the feedback of Pete Townsend's guitar and everything like that, and he actually got a piece of um, Pete Townsend's Smash Rickenbacker. Yeah, he's like, how do I make this into music? Yeah. And then he came home and, um, you know, hooked up with Iggy. And at that time, like, Iggy was just at home, just figuring music. And he would just be in bed, like, pull the sheets over his head and just listen, You Really Got Me by the Kinks. I was just watching their documentary. They have a great documentary. I saw. I seen it. Yeah, it's awesome. And he said he, when he was a kid, he went on a tour of one of the car factories. And he said he came to a machine that was just, like, going, <laughs> Like in rhythm, like one mm. at a time. And he was a little kid and he's like, how do I, I want to make that sound. Mm. I want to, I want to like put something to that. And I, I think that's his music. Iggy's a, a madman. When you see him on stage, like he, he, he mutilated himself. Dude. Like, he, on stage. Like, he, like you got to think about where your, your mind is at, at that state where you're going to literally start cutting yourself up on stage. Dude, he was putting peanut butter on himself. Yeah, yeah he was. He was I, up in. The, he was like surfing. He he invented the crowd, crowd surfing. surfing. Yeah, you know? I always thought that was funny that he was the first one to do the crowd surfing before there was even a name for it. No, it, it was. And he's all bloody with peanut butter on, him and he's slipping all over the place. He didn't care, man. He was, Dude, he, I don't think anybody at the show cared. Like, he, was, he was living through the music. He a, he was a madman, and he's one of those larger than life characters. That there's there's a ton of them in this story that we're going to talk about. Yeah, I love them in Snow Day. Was he in Snow Day? He was in Snow Day. <laughs> That's right on, man. Right on. Who you got next? A band that you wanted to talk about, a band called Death. Yeah. These guys, man, most people have never even heard of them. But let's, They're funky, dude. Yeah, let's, They're stay, funky. let's stay in Detroit. Death is a band. This is like 1974, so we're jumping ahead a little bit. It's three African-American brothers who were in a funk band. They saw The Who in concert, mm -hmm. so it's, a, again, and they decided to change their sound. Let me play a little bit, and then I'll touch on it. This is some pretty wild stuff. What year is this? 74. Oh, yeah. You put that on now, and that's a hit. That yeah, absolutely, it's unreal. Like nobody was doing anything. Like their yeah. musicianship's like crazy. A couple of things about them. So they're this is before the Ramones. Yeah, two sure. years before the Ramones, before the Clash. They're singing about politics in their music. So you think about bands like Rage Against the Machine and all mm. that stuff in in punk music, and there are three black guys 
yeah. playing punk rock in this in the early seventies, man. Pretty wild, and they were largely forgotten. I think they said somebody rediscovered their master tapes in like two thousand nine and brought them back up kind of the surface. And I think some of their stuff has been in like Tony Hawk or Yeah, no, like I read that. that. And that, like that's kind of like when I got familiar with them, like kind of I guess it was like two thousand and twelve maybe when I first heard them. Like, who are these guys? Like this is amazing. Like that song I listened to over and over and over. And just that bass line is just amazing who was doing that really cool song that i never would have even known about had i not been it's doing my it's, research it's for great this, so all right guys we're gonna go from the detroit to new york city we're gonna talk about the new york dolls great band great band <laughs> great band lead singer david johansson guitar god johnny thunders bassist arthur kane and um S- sullivan sullivan who just passed away he, yeah I, I just read that in the paper yeah yeah away. that's and, a bummer and jerry nolan and yeah. they were basically drag queens playing this aggressive music once again they were getting dressed up maybe they weren't drag queens well you know there's like glam like so at that point in time how do you like separate glam the punk or was it the same thing then punk was even a thing yet. yeah it was just an aggression yeah you know? it, it didn't have a name yeah so I guess everything was like glam. Those guys did everything first that made popular in America, I think. You let's, know, let's give them a listen. What do you want? Personality crisis? Yeah, yeah. Do, do that one. Very cool. Man, when I hear that, I I can, can connect the dots between them to Motley Crue. Oh, I hear yeah. the party oh, sure. sound, the outfits. Uh, Nikki Six said he got a lot of influence from the New York Dolls. But then you even listen to it, like, and you see their influences, like from the fifties, just that that piano banging. Oh yeah. So I think they were considered punk rock, but they were a rock and roll band also. Totally. And I guess what made them controversial, not necessarily the music, is just the way that they looked and. They were going in the places, and can you imagine you're David Johansson, and you're in drag, and you're in New York City, and you're getting up on a stage, and you're about to play, and everybody's calling you names and throwing shit at you. And they were the right. first like ones that. to do it. Nobody did it before Yeah, and, you yeah. Know, and they were so brave to go up there and do something new like that. You're in the dirty, dingy New York that uh, Lou Reed is singing about sure. at yeah. the same time. New York City was so important to the 70s and the music scene. Everything came out of New York City. They had so many great recording yeah. studios in New York City. And that's when they took everything from California, where a lot of attention on California and the recording, like from the Beach Boys and to whoever. And then it got real. Like it kind of made everything look stupid. Before, like, before we move on to another band, I think there's two other things we should mention about the New York Dolls. The first one is David Johansson, also known as Buster Poindexter. Absolutely. Yes. Hot, hot, hot. You're going to play that song? Let's not. Let's That's not play not, that song. Let's not, not, not. And <laughs> also, the taxi driver and the ghost of Christmas past. Go back to Jersey, you bum. It's Scrooge. Yeah, I, I wonder why he didn't do more acting. He's great in it. Yeah. Um, he, totally. One other character I, want, I think we should introduce into the story right now okay. is their manager. Okay. Malcolm McLaren. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. That guy. Yeah. So their first two albums didn't do real well. Their label dumps them. And this guy, Malcolm McLaren, comes on as their manager. And he's important in the story. Oh, okay, totally. Absolutely. He was a fashion designer, a musician, a promoter. He did some of the costumes for the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Mm-hmm. So he signs on with them. And he had the band up their glamness another notch. And they all started wearing red leather from head to toe. Wow. And they were singing in front of a giant Soviet Union flag. <laughs> Considering that this is like the early 70s, that didn't fly real well. Oh, and Got uh, him noticed, though. He, they wind up dumping him. And he moves back to, to England, England and he'll come up a little yeah. later in yeah. the story. Yeah, I got a little story about him. Yeah. A little um, band. I also saw that Martin Scorsese is doing a documentary on the New York Dolls. Really? Is he really? Awesome. Oh, really that's going to cool. be great. Yeah. I'd, I'd be really be looking forward to that. They have a great story behind it, especially Johnny Thunders, man. Yeah. Okay, he, he wasn't the greatest guitar player around, but he had that swag, and he was a great songwriter for what it's worth. What was the one song that he wrote that's real popular? You Can't Put Your Arms Around, around a memory. memory. Yeah. What a great song that is. Johnny Thunders was a big deal for to punk rock music. He had a really bad addiction, man. He was really- Yeah, he died really young. Yeah, he was haunted. He was, he was in a bad way. That's another thing about punk rock that this yeah. story is literally oh, my people God. that died really young. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, drugs. It's a hell of a drug. Drugs yeah. are hell of a drug. Drugs are hell of a drug. Well, we still have Iggy, though. 
Iggy's we, still going. Iggy never really got. Too, yeah, no, he was he was know? doing heroin with David Bowie, man. Yeah, well, he, you, like, know, you can't kill him or Keith Richards. <laughs> I guess they're going to be around. Yeah, but Keith always gets the uh, the notoriety. No, everybody just forgets about Iggy. Yeah, Iggy, he's still running around with his shirt off, and he just looks. No, like he, he looks great. Of, he's yeah. still doing it, man. He's just made out of broken glass and barbed wire. Yeah, God, he he's probably have every bone in his body broken at one point. You ever see that that footage of him diving head first into the microphone? Oh yeah, the microphone stand like. He he does it with no fear. He looks like, like a like a log just has been cut and like falls a dead, over. Totally, totally timber. But uh, going back to New York Dolls, do you remember when we saw them? Oh yeah, we did see them. We saw them on our birthday one year at the Troc. They were awesome. What a great, great, great show! Like Bruce said, bands like Motley Crue and absolutely, I'm sure bands like Dokken and all these other glam bands. Poison, and, and- yeah, totally took influence from the New York Dolls. They're very important. Absolutely. Who you got next in our timeline here? Yeah, another band I actually want to talk about about the Sonics. They were labeled first to be like that garage punk rock sound, like that we were talking about when the uh, American version yeah, of hard the, rock was coming out. The original definition of punk a, rock, a, a punk rock, and like hard bands. rock, yeah, garage band, punk garage, rock. yeah, yeah. And um, he, they had a song called "He's Waiting," and nobody was really doing music like this before them. You know, even though like. Like other influences at the time, but they had a song again. It's called "He's Waiting," but some of the lyrics in this thing: "It's too late, you lied, and now you will fry." This is like in the early '60s, so this song is basically about Satan finding like his girlfriend with another man. Oh, love story! Yeah. So this the song is rock. Dude, that's pretty heavy for 1965. That is. I was digging that. I have never heard of this band before yeah. until you just mentioned this. Kind of reminds me of uh, the Animals a little bit. Sure, maybe a little bit of Stephen Wolf. Maybe definitely. Maybe that's where Stephen Wolf. I don't know what time, when year they came out, but uh, I'm maybe around the same time. All right, sweet. Let's jump back into the 70s and continue the story. Okay, guys, we're going to talk about 1975 now. I'm going to talk about the first lady of punk. Who, Debbie Harry? No, but I do love her. She She's awesome. But no, we're going to talk about Patti Smith. She graduated from Defford High over, if you're Jersey. Did she really? Yeah, she, she's definitely a, not from Jersey, but she graduated high school in Jersey. Kind of like me and you. We, yes. we graduated high school in Jersey, but we're not from New Jersey. Yes. But she got out as fast as she could. So did she we. graduated. And she moved to New York City, where she tried her best to become poet. Bruce, what do you know about her? Well, the album Horses came out in 75. It's yeah. considered one of the first punk rock. I know she was really part of the CBGB scene. And uh, that album has a cover of Gloria by them. And them was the garage rock band that Van Morrison was in. It's a rock and garage rock song. Why don't we play a little play bit of that? Play a little bit of that, yeah. man. I, I hear what people say, like that she's like punk rock and everything like that. But you know, she's more definitely more punk rock than Debbie Harry. Totally, Absolutely. she would get up on stage and start reading poetry, like Rambo and all this stuff, and start calling everybody pig fuckers and stuff. <laughs> like she would like yell at, at everybody in the crowd to pay attention to her. It's like this is beautiful poetry. You pick. She's just going at it. Yeah, she's a little too artsy for me. Yeah. You know, of course, she does the cover of "Because the Night" that Springsteen wrote for. I guess. I guess her version is more popular. Yeah, than, I was. I, than I was his. So, yeah. I, I preferred the Ten Thousand Maniacs version from their. MPB yeah, that's a good Unplugged. version. Also, yeah. Um, she also was the last person to play at CBGB, which I'm sure we'll talk about. How do you CBGB's feel about that? Bit. Like, do you think that's fitting? I think it's awesome that Patty Smith. Yeah, she had a close. She, there. Was, she she was there opening the place. Yeah, she was there to close the place. Yeah. Yeah, not my favorite thing. I got to be honest. I think her attitude was more punk than actually her music, yeah. you know, and that's cool, I guess. Like she, she was there. She was living art. 
she was hanging out with Dee Dee Ramone and all that. And yeah, like, she you was, know she was definitely the beginning of punk. Yeah. They're all sharing junk together. Who we got next? All right, boys, we finally made it to 1976. This is the year where all of it blows up. 76 is like the ground zero for punk music. And the greatest band in the world we're going to talk about now are the Ramones. The Ramones, I voted my number one best American rock and roll band, and I still back it up. You can't go wrong with the Ramones. The four guys that barely didn't even like each other. <laughs> they, they were that punk rock. They were that punk rock. They were, each, they were getting fights on stage. Oh, yeah. They they were like brothers. Everybody knows the Ramones. But let's play a little bit of the Ramones. You could tell Joey Ramone loved Phil Spector style, mm. the doo-wop style of all through the late 50s, early 60s. This is Judy's a Punk. That song is still fresh. Totally. I heard yeah. it a thousand times. I hear it a thousand times more. It doesn't get old. And for guys who openly said that they stink and they don't know yeah. how to play their instruments, but they still had Phil Spector producing their stuff totally. and bringing the wall of sound to punk music. Dude, they were freaks. They were freaks that could only find each other and become a band. I- I thought about that when you mentioned that in that in the podcast. I totally agree. I with think you on that, that I think they were destined to be together. I think and- God went up over to Forest Hills, New York, and got them all together. They found each other, and he said, "Hey ho, let's go." Joey and Johnny, like toward the end of their career, they're traveling in a van. They weren't even talking to each other. No, they, that whole tour, they really had a bad relationship all through, all, all through the. They all did. Johnny hated everybody, but I think the 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 most. Important Ramon is is Dee Dee Ramon during like the seventies and all that, and going back to New York Dolls. Dee Dee wanted to start wearing more flashy clothes. He he like when he wasn't on stage, he would dress dress in glam, and this and that. And he would show up to a gig, and Johnny's like, "Yeah, take that shit off. Yeah, like pe- you're not getting on stage like that. No, this is why I'm dressed like." He's like, "You have a uniform. Yeah, and pe- his uniform is the leather jacket, his blue jeans, the, the t shirt, whatever, and the Chuck Taylors, and a one, two, three, four. Dee Dee wrote all those songs. You know, he lived those songs. He lived them, you know, 53rd third, and 3rd. Yeah. How did he come up with like, all these amazing songs that he couldn't even put a sentence together? <laughs> that's, no, a, he, that's a good point. No, but he, <laughs> he was just so like... That's a very good point. So gone with drugs, he couldn't even yeah. put a sentence together. But he's making these wonderful timeless songs i think he just saw like the moment and thing like he recorded like a a, a rap album he so, did and that and like I, I couldn't even tell you what it was about he had a video for it, it was he looked like a clown he was and then he got his you know whatever back on with the rock and roll hall of fame but um i think he was just like whatever whatever was popular he wanted to go for he saw what was popular you know even though that he was part of the most popular thing and the most legendary thing he always wanted to be something else well you always want to be more than you are always does it doesn't matter what accomplishment you you come yeah. by you like you oh, still want to be relevant yeah, yeah definitely and it's funny that they were such an iconic influential punk band but they openly talked about how much they loved like bubblegum pop music oh yeah like uh they they really liked the chanting in a Bay City Roller song called Saturday Night, and that's what inspired them to come up with the Hey Ho, Let's Go and Blitzkrieg Bop. That makes sense. And there's a lot of other stuff. I've even heard if you listen to that Judy is a punk rocker that we just played, and then you play Communication Breakdown yeah. by Zeppelin, yeah, yeah. you yeah. you hear the, the influence yeah. Yeah. In, that, in that song. But it's funny. Dude, those guys are a bunch of Kang- Captain Kangaroo watching, like – like Peanut Gallery from like Buffalo Bill or Howdy Doody or whatever. That was what they grew up on. They grew up on like Saturday morning cartoons and cereal and Jerry Ramone was the greatest rock star ever. I mean, I said it before. I don't think there's anything else that he could have been except a rock star. Joey was a definitely liberal when when Johnny was yeah, like Johnny's just hardcore Republican, Republican, hardcore, you know, Republican. and they would they would bang heads. About and that's politics. interesting by itself. One of the biggest punk rock guys out there, Johnny Ramone was a hardcore Republican. Eddie Vedder just talked about it on Stern. And he's like, he got along with, they were like friends. 
And like he would, Jai would challenge Ed because Eddie Vedder's a big, you know, liberal, but he would like just ask him about really hardcore questions. Ed would come back with answers. He's like, that's good. That's good. You know what you're talking about. You know, like, you know, Johnny was totally political. I think it was his downfall. <laughs> but do you think it was his band? Do you think it was Johnny's band? It was totally John's band. Yeah. He told everybody. Everybody was scared of him. Sure. Everybody was scared of him. I he, think I'm scared of him. He would walk around and tell his wife, Linda, living legend, legend. I'm a living legend. He told those guys, this is the uniform we're going to wear. We're going to be called the Ramones. And I'm getting all the t-shirt money. <laughs> Did he? <laughs> <laughs> and also... They go over to England on tour in July of 76, and the people that wind up being in The Clash, The Sex Pistols, mm-hmm. and The Damned all see one of those shows. Yeah, They launched the inva- the American yeah. invasion yeah. of punk music. What was Billy Idol's band? Generation X. Generation X. X. They, like, there was yeah. one show, like the Sex, the Sex Pistols formed there. Generation X joined there, and some other band. I don't know. Me and Ryan talked about the Sex Pistols so much and how the Ramones are the real deal. And Johnny Rotten wants to be this, and you know Johnny Rotten would be that. But he was terrified of the Ramones. Oh, he thought they were going to beat him up. Yeah. They he thought they were a gang. Yeah. Well, that's funny that you're talking about the Sex Pistols because that's the next band we're going to talk about. In 1977, the Sex Pistols came out. They were basically a group put together by a guy named Malcolm McLaren, which we were just talking about earlier. He was a store owner at Chelsea Boutique called Sex. And it was like a, a bondage store before it called the punk rock style. They would definitely shop there for all like this thing, this this style that we were talking about earlier, this this glam bobby pin tear off yeah. yeah look that the Sex Pistols made. And it was all Malcolm's idea. Johnny Rotten was a guy that was hanging out in a store. Like, it wasn't like an SMM store or something like it that? It was. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. it was totally doing that. Yeah. So, and the thing with the Sex Pistols is they only put out one album. They're only yeah. together for two and a half yeah. years. And yeah. Sid Vicious didn't even play on the album. Right. But that, there's no. another thing I wanted to bring up about Sid Vicious, Ryan, in your opinion. Now, Sid Vicious, like, he stinks. He, whatever. And all he was was a product of... Of of fashion and popularity. That's all he was. And he was just like, he was a good looking kid and they put him in the band. Dude, you know what else I read? Lemmy tried to teach him how to play bass and he couldn't get it together. No, he was too he much of a junkie. Yeah, he couldn't even, he couldn't even like process it. The original yeah. bass player of the Sex Pistols name was Glenn Matlock. Right. And he's the one that was on the albums. Dude, that album is awesome. And, he, and he, his mother made him quit the band because he said, God, they won't let, his mother didn't want him singing about the Queen or something like that. Something like that. Yeah. They started as a band called The Strand in like 72. And they said, like before, like Johnny Rotten, they, they had another singer named Wally Nightingale, who, and the guy looks like somebody named Wally Nightingale. <laughs> he, had, like, the gla- he looks like an accountant. That's funny. And he said that they... Would- Hello, my name's Jeffrey. <laughs> yeah. And they got their equipment. They would break into venues and steal equipment from like... They stole some of Rod Stewart stuff. That's they stole great. some of Bob Marley stuff. Dude, they're a bunch of dirt balls, in my opinion. And like, then they went know. to that store Yeah, and they were talking to Malcolm McLaren and he wanted to start another project after the New York Dolls. And he was like, I'll manage you guys, but you got to get rid of the nerd. Sure. And they were like... uh, you over in the corner with the green hair, and he, they said uh, Johnny Rotten was wearing a Pink Floyd T-shirt, so and I it hate. written "I hate" on it. So you could be my <laughs> singer. And they, I never heard that. And they they fired the other guy because he wasn't punk rock enough. Yeah. And they had and Johnny Lydon. They put Alice Cooper's "I'm 18" on the jukebox in the store and had him sing over it. Uh-huh. And that's where they convinced him to come in. And they Malcolm started calling him Johnny Rotten because his dental hygiene was so terrible. Yeah, they were basically a boy band put together by Malcolm. Yeah, yeah, um, a, a mutant version of I a boy ta- band. Let's talk about the most punk rock guy there is, though. Steve Jones, he's right the guitar yeah. player for the Sex. He's the real. He's punk the talent. Rock. He's the whole talent though in that he, whole band. He definitely is the most punk rock guy because he he didn't wear any makeup. He didn't wear anything. It was like his attitude. He would beat the, beat the shit out of you. Sure. He was definitely a tough guy. He was so tough, he thought all the other guys were posers. He thought of, he thought himself was a poser. I understand he probably comes from a working class background. Don't get me wrong. I have a lot of respect for the Sex Pistols, and I really do love the Sex Pistols. Like you said, they were put together by a manager. I think the downfall of punk was the thing that made it popular anyway was mm. was the attitude 
and the outrageous fashion. And they're one of the first bands that starts the fighting on stage. Like their first yeah. gig, they open for a band called Bazooka Joe and they get in a fist fight on the stage. <laughs> And uh, the only thing about Bazooka Joe is one of the members winds up becoming Adam Ant, the guy from the 80s. Oh, oh, I, did, oh I never heard that. I'm sure Bazooka, Bazooka Joe lost that fight. The Sex Pistols get national attention because they went on a show called Today that was broadcast in London and as a, to do an interview. And they were invited at the last minute. Because they were on the same record label as Queen, and Freddie Mercury bailed out because he had a dentist appointment. <laughs> go figure, Freddie Mercury had to go to a that dentist. So they, in, so they invite <laughs> the Sex Pistols. They roll up with their entourage, and the host, Bill Grundy, gets drunk before the show, and he's being a jerk. Yeah. He's talking to the audience and talking about the band in the third person, even though they're sitting right next to him. And this is so weird. Susie Sue from Susie and the Banshees is sitting with the audience, and she goes like, hey, I've always wanted to meet you. And the guy goes like, oh, do you really? Well, we shall have to meet afterwards. And the band thinks he's hitting on her, and then it just spirals out of oh, I'm control. Sure. Let me, I'm sure let me play the clip. I'm sure he just that then. What about you girls behind? Oh, your dad, isn't he? Are you, uh... <laughs> your granddad. Are you worried or are you just enjoying yourself? Enjoying myself. Are you? Yeah. Ah, that's what I thought you were doing. I always wanted to meet you. Did you really? Yeah. We'll meet afterwards, shall we? <laughs> you dirty yeah. son. Yeah. You dirty <laughs> old man. Well, keep going, Chief. Keep going. <laughs> Go on, you've got another five you seconds. Say something outrageous. You dirty man. bastard. Go on, again. <laughs> you dirty fucker. What a, <laughs> what a fucking rotter. Well, that's it for tonight. And that was broadcast in London, on like, the live. Yeah. Like, Dude, I've seen that happen in this bar at, like, 1.30 in the morning. Like, some old guy hitting on some, like, young girls. I've seen that happen where people just get agitated. And, first of all, everybody on that in that show was on some kind of substance. They were all <laughs> drunk or something. Or, like oh, God. It, it was it, like an explosion right now. I don't happen. know how they got Steve Jones on there. He had the shirt on. He had boobs like totally out and it was like not even blurred out or the, anything. The, the Daily Mirror, the big newspaper in London the next day had a headline on the front page that said the filth and fury and that makes the Sex pistol the villains, sure. the bad guys and it makes them household names. Play uh, God Save the Queen. Let's hear... Let's let the people hear them a little bit. They don't know it. The fascist regime that made you a moron. Potential hate bomb. God save the queen. She ain't no human being. And there's no future in England screaming. Don't Yeah, I love it. I love the Sex Pistols, man. I was a teenager when I first heard the Sex Pistols. And I think the greatest thing about that recording is how it was recorded. You know, you're in the midst of groundbreaking recording studios and the way they mix everything. If you listen to that album, it's really gritty. Sure. Like, like yeah, it's, it has a it's sound really mixed. Yeah. And, I, and yeah. I realized that when I first heard it, I was like, wow, this is a really shitty recording. But it's great, though, in its own way. But you learn as you go on to really appreciate that sound, what they were trying to go for. Sure. It was so original. I, I love Johnny Rotten. I, lo I think he is the most truthful person in music. Really? Yeah, I think he's an asshole. His lyrics are awesome. He wrote all those songs. And you know what's great about him? He's a great lyricist. And what he does is he, he doesn't let words rhyme. Yeah. If, if you listen yeah. to his songs, like yeah. none of his words rhyme. Yeah. Like in, a, in like how the Ramones, yeah. all their songs like rhyme and have like this yeah. punk rock thing to it. Like how many years? Like 44 years, 45 years that album was released. But he's still riding off of that. Well, you know, you know, no, no, because it was that great. It was that great. It was that great. Is that groundbreaking? They put like, a lot of work into that album. Oh, I'm and he, sure, and sure they did. He's who I think of when I hear punk music. He's the dude that comes to my mind. Do you think yeah. so? Nah. Yeah. That's for I, me. That's, I that's hear what you. I think of. I hear you. Johnny Rotten is one of a kind. That whole attitude, like he invented that attitude. And I hate, I hate that that band gets situated 
with Sid Vicious. Yeah. Like, Sid Vicious is Sex Pistols on Mm T-shirts and everything. He had nothing to do with the band. He's more popular than the band. Glenn Matlock did all the bass playing on that album. Yeah. And they had to throw Glenn Matlock out of the band because his hygiene was too good. And I heard his mom wouldn't let him sing songs about the Queen also. Yes. As we just heard, God Save the Queen. I love the, the lyric in there. It's later on. It says, there's no future. There's no future in me. There's truth in that, though. Totally. In Especially the 70s. How, old, how old was he Like when he did that? Like no, 18, was, 19 years old? Yeah, there was yeah. no future for the... No, in, they in, weren't thinking forward. No, you know. They all are squatters. They yeah. all come from nothing. The only thing they had was this movement of mm-hmm. like bondage. You know, yeah, they 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 were a gang, as you would say. Like the Ramones were a gang, but they were they were a different kind of band, a gang, I guess. They were definitely dangerous kids, though. Yeah, you know, if they weren't doing that, they'd probably be knifing somebody in some alley, robbing them. They went through three record labels in a year and a half. Yeah, it was the yeah. EMI, right? EMI, yeah, they were at EMI, and then they wrote a song about EMI. EMI. And they got thrown off at EMI, and then they went to A and M, and they signed with A and M on March 10th, and they were dropped on March 16th. Because they got drunk, <laughs> trashed the offices, and Johnny Rotten threatened to murder one of the friends of one of the A&M executives. Mm. A&M had already printed 25,000 copies of God Save the Queen. I don't know if those are like – if you the, can find those. They're or probably so items. much worth – they're probably worth a lot and, of And money. they signed to Virgin Records, and a lot of the workers printing the records – refused to they they were like we're not doing this we're not making this album because it was coming out right at the queen that was silver jubilee and they did a uh they did a tour a boat thing didn't they they did they did a sh- they did a show during the jubilee <laughs> on a boat because you, you can go out on a boat and be like on england's grounds so they, you're pirating basically they went down the thames past parliament <laughs> playing, playing music and they were Arrest uh, uh, Malcolm McLaren and a whole bunch of other people in the boat all got arrested. And the story is that that song really was going to go to number one. And the BBC was like, oh, no, not. <laughs> they blanked it out. They pulled it and they put Rod Stewart as number one. Oh. So they, it did uh, make they, it did make number one. And they, they decided not to publish it as number one. They people have said that that song was selling two to one to mm. that whatever Rod Stewart song it was. But the BBC was like. No way is that going to be number one. But when it, they were with, number, that's hilarious. I but when they were that. number two, they put a blank spot. Oh, really? Yeah. Like, so they totally just like shunned them all. Like, yeah. Okay. Not, yeah. Th- you're not exist. giving them any credit whatsoever. And there's a Virgin record store that had one of their displays, like some of their stuff in the display. And the Virgin record store gets sued for obscenities. They start getting into fights. Uh, gig. They have to start booking gigs under fake band names because venues won't sign them anymore. It was it was unbelievable. I never heard any of this. this yeah, is, this is amazing. They would go. To, they would had such a bad reputation. They're like, we just got to show up to these gigs, and they're going to tell us not to play, and we'll still get paid. So and, they would just go to the gig. Say, oh, we're we're a sex, but oh, you guys can't play tonight. Oh, well, you still got to pay us. Sure, they did that a lot. They probably didn't even show with their stuff. They're a couple, like, a couple other like just notes i had on them was that members of the buzzcocks started their band immediately after seeing the sex pistols and that the clash the sex pistols and the damned all went on tour together in 76 Christ. and it was called the anarchy tour and most of the clubs canceled because they were scared to death i would them. be sure and after when they when they break up when the sex pistols broke up richard branson who ran virgin tried to get Johnny Rotten to become the lead singer of Devo. <laughs> but Devo and Johnny Rotten both disagree. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Could you imagine <laughs> like, that? Can you imagine? No. Johnny, Johnny Rotten. No. <laughs> he's, Johnny Rotten's going to be like this old man, He's and he's just going to be saying, fuck you until yeah. the end. Did you like that PIL band that he was in? Public Image Limited. Yeah. yeah. Did you like any of that? Nah. 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 It, it was kind of like, you know, I think that band was popular just because he was in it. Like, I know a lot of people do like that band, though. That whole Sex Pistol yeah. thing will carry him through but everything. That's what I mean. Like, he, like he's like he been riding that for... For, for a billion for, years. For that ever. was whole thing. You know, Steve Jones also. I just can't say enough about Steve Jones, about how much he, that album is all him. Mm. In Anarchy in the UK, that's when yeah. they, they fired Glatt Metlock, and they did the bass track by himself. Mm-hmm. So it's it's like the only song that... 
Steve Jones plays both instruments yeah. on. And that's it's hand down their most popular song. I think. Yeah. Anarchy and in the UK that everybody knows that everybody song. covered that song. And yeah. Sid Vicious was so messed up that they started they brought Glenn Matlock back as a session guy. Yeah. To play on a lot of those songs. Yeah. They did a a tour maybe ten years ago with the Sex Pistols and he was back on the tour with them. Yeah. So I guess that's it on the Sex Pistols. Maybe before we move on to the next band in the story, I want to circle back a little bit and talk about the damned. So The Damned was the first UK punk band to release a single and release an album and tour in the United States. So mm. the Ramones come over here. Oh, really? They're one of the first ones to go back. And I said earlier that The Damned were in the audience and they saw the Ramones in those shows. The first show they ever played, they opened for the Sex Pistols. The drummer for The Damned, Rat Scabies, used to be in a band with Chrissy Hind from The Pretenders. Cool. Really? She also worked at that store, Sex, in London. Where yeah, Malcolm I did McClane. see that. So really? She's, kind of, she's, kind she's of, everywhere. She's kind she of was around. there for the punk rock scene. That's man. amazing. Yeah. She had a front row seat. Dude, that's amazing. I didn't know that. The guitarist, Brian James, from The Damned, used to be in a band with members who went on to be in The Clash and Generation X. But their song, New Rose, is really considered oh, the first yeah. British yeah. UK song. It came out five weeks before the Sex Pistols came out with Anarchy in the UK. Let me just play a little bit of it, because it's really the first no, it British song. Awesome. That song's great. That was it. I just wanted to make sure we mentioned them. They they have an important role in this. They're the no, first, it's a great the first song. song. So let's continue on with the story. The next band that we were to talk about is the only band that matters, and that is The Clash. <laughs> Do you like The Clash more than you like The Ramones? It's hard. I would definitely have to say, yeah. After doing all this research and revisiting music, I would have to say The Clash is more influential over me these days. The Clash, they were a way better band. Instead of doing the downstroke, they did the upstroke sure, also, sure. You know, which a lot of punk rockers didn't do. That's a great question, too. It's like, no, it's because it, I thought about it. I remember when Joe Strummer died, and a good friend of ours was here with us. who We actually learned a lot of punk rock from, from our buddy Neil. And he came in. He's like, how does Joe Strummer die? Like, yeah, I remember. You know, I remember. It's like I thought about that. I was like, I thought about that the other day. Like, how does Joe Strummer die? He was, he was the the king of punk rock. He was the smartest guy in punk rock. Yeah, yeah. The they were they were on another level than the Sex Pistols mm-hmm. or the Ramones. They were they had these time signature things going mm-hmm. on for them. There was a lot of reggae going on in their music. The, the, the influence was crazy. Now, Ryan, let me ask you a serious question about the Clash. Who is more important, the Clash, Joe Strummer or Mick Jones? Wow, it's like saying I know it's, it's a like really hard Paul question. Or John, I know I've been wait. I was waiting all night to we can get Joe the Strummer. Clash. Joe you th- Strummer, you think so? Up. Straight up, really? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Like Mick Jones, though. I don't he, know. Joe dude, Strummer. He wrote like oh no, he wrote some great dude, songs like, too. Dude, he sings on Train in Vain. Yeah, like, Mick Jones sings Train in Vain. He wrote like Lost in the Supermarket. He wrote Should I Stay or Should I Go. He sang Should I Stay or Should I Go. Yeah, but, you know what I mean. I think that he doesn't like Joe Strummer gets like the face of the Clash. Dude, Joe dude. Strummer sings fucking London Call. I know. Pure at the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pure at the end. But it, dude, Mick Jones wrote, uh, was just as important to that band. No, you he know? was awesome. They were supposed to get back together before but, and Joe died. Yeah. 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 Can we play some of the Clash? Yeah, man. What do you want to hear? I I will play the clash anytime you want Dude, all day long i'm so bored with the usa we could be doing an episode on patsy klein and i would play the clash Like the, the musicianship of the Clash is just like, better, way but, better way, than yeah, way better than the Ramones, than yeah. the Sex Pistols, than like, anybody. They they were just better musicians. They had a better drummer. Not that I'm saying that Tommy Ramone wasn't a good drummer or the Sex Pistols didn't have a good drummer, but the Clash had a friggin' great drummer. 
I, and I love here again how everything is all connected because Mick Jones said he saw the Sex Pistols and that's when he said like I could wanna, do it better. We want to start a band. <laughs> I could do it better. Yeah. And uh, one of the original members, Kevin Levine, he winds up being in Public Image Limited with mm. Johnny Rotten after after the Sex Pistols blow up. It's just I love that how it's all connected. Like I like how the Sex Pistols just paved the way. Like they they did. They I did. like I'll admit it. You the, know the, the Sex Pistols just made punk like a, a household name fashionable like i said the the sex pistols was one of the greatest things that happened to punk rock but also one of the worst things because punk rock became spitting on being thrown up on being grossed out on like that's what the sex pistols were all about like their fans would come up and blow snot rockets well, all over the place they'd be like really fucking gross and that's what punk rock got considered for so long well, it's a shame like bands like the ramones were like this clean cut band at the end of the day sure you know at the end of the, compared to the safety pins and the tear rip yeah. shirts you know i think that english version yeah. of punk rock ruined punk rock well, well it's funny like you know with the spitting and this and that and that at the shows dude joe strummer got hepatitis for somebody spitting a loogie yeah. in his mouth yeah you know he got hepatitis from that uh, i didn't have to curse anybody out but I, I you know uh joe strummer like you know his father was like a member of the most excellent order of the british empire which basically make him and makes him a knight so then he went to boarding school for the next, and he barely saw his parents for the next seven years. Yeah, once he then he got out, and he's like, you know what, you guys left me here. Yeah. I'm gonna go off and do my own thing. Well, you know, it's really a shame about he had an older brother named David, and he went to boarding school also, and he was just haunted, and he committed suicide. Oh, he was 20 no, years old. Well. Yeah, it's like really sad. So you you think about where that all comes through with Strummer, with him being a songwriter and an artist, definitely crazy. They you know? they, they were the only band that matters. I mean, yeah, Christ, I got it poster of london calling in the bar like one of strummer's main major influences that he never played music it was for the beach boys so like his influences like strand from all over the place it's in this music yeah you yeah. hear it ever the reggae yeah. the rockabilly yeah. like, ska music like the ramones were very limited on what they could do the sex pistols they only had one album in yeah. them, and that was the end of it but they were limited there was no limit with the clash they had off tempo yeah they had They're all kinds of different kind of music that they were into besides punk rock and you hear it in their music. Like one of the greatest things, and I know Ryan, you really love the story, is that they came to New York City and they hired all this graffiti artists to yeah. do the big mural yep. with them. Yeah. Where their stage for Mad Square Garden, right? What actually it was, the Clash were set to play in a club in Times Square. And the club outsold the venue a billion times over. So let's say the Clash agreed to do five shows. They're like, they found out that they oversold it and they wind up doing, let's say, like 10 to 15 shows. Mm -hmm. They wind up doing from five shows to 10 to 15 shows from oversold. So they were doing like two shows a day. Okay. And they were picking up this New York vibe and there was a lot of kids around, like little black kids break dancing mm -hmm. and everything like that. And he saw the art kind of thing and yeah. the, the you know the kids start hanging out with them while they're on the street mm -hmm. and so they all start graffitiing and they pulled out this huge banner that says the clash that like basically the neighborhood kids made up for mm -hmm. them because they were did such a long standing at the club anybody can give the ramones a run for their money is the clash and i think that do you think the ramones knew that I think the Ramones knew that they were better musicians. But they just did what they but did, and they did what they did. They're not the Ramones either, dude. No, that's yeah. true. Like, no, no, yeah. no, absolutely. They're, the yeah. Clash is like the only band that yeah. matters, but dude, you're yeah. not the no, Ramones. I, no, you can't be the Ramones. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, agree. I, I thought it was interesting with the Clash, too. So like they they got a pretty big record deal before they even put an album out. They got 100,000 pounds from CBS Records in 77. They hadn't even put out an album. They'd only play like 30 shows, and... People immediately start calling them sellouts. And I found a clip of this old <laughs> British punk magazine called Sniff and Glue that said punk music has died the day the clash signed with CBS. Oh, that, that's ridiculous. Come so that's on. again the 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 punks turning on themselves. Yeah, you know, you're a sellout, you're a poser. Dude, that's well that's all, the whole thing. That's all they do is turn on each yeah. other. And and I agree, they're one of the greatest bands of all time. They are. Yeah. Absolutely love the clash. Um, one other band I actually want to, are we done talking about the clash? Are we good? Or we can keep on going for we hours and can hours. hours and talk about the clash and, but you know, we're not going to do that. We're going to move on. Yeah. Okay. okay. One band I want to talk about before we take our break is this band from Ireland called Stiff Little Fingers. They're considered the clash of Ireland. They are awesome band. They are an amazing band. I think the first time I ever heard them, me and Ryan went to go see Dropkick and they opened up for Dropkick In, and, and they just 
uh, me and Ryan were standing there like, what is this? They blew it away. They blew it. Bruce, can you play the song Sussex Device? Yeah. You can hear the influence yeah. from like all these bands now that maybe they heard of Stiff Little Finger. Man, yeah. they're such an awesome band. Yeah, I remember both of you guys got me into them a couple of years ago, and I saw them. Maybe they opened for when the Dropkick Murphys and Flogging Molly played together. Yeah, they're yeah, always no, they around. They did. They did. Yeah. Irish Overload concert. Yes, the Stiff Little Fingers. They're so underrated. If you never heard of them, give them a listen. Their first album. That's all you really. Yeah. Their first album is pretty much. Their we, most important album. They got a little weird in the 80s. Yeah, we you know? challenge your punk rock to check out Stiff Little Finger. Maybe before we wrap up, I want to hit on one other band that's been kind of floating around with this, and that's Generation X. I've got two totally. points on them. Yeah. No, so, totally. Um, they were kind of going to a lot of these other shows, and Generation X is most popular or most well-known because their lead singer is Billy Idol. Nah. And again, when they put out an album... Everybody, the whole punk scene just turns on them. They're I would turn on them too. You're manufactured. They Absolutely. call them plastic. Yep. Yeah. Um, just a great example of people in the scene accusing others of being posers. And and he goes solo and he really embraces his pop sound that he becomes like the commercial. He oh, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I never considered him to be punk ever. His haircut was punk. Yeah, That's his about haircut, it. the leather jacket. He's the... got a great personality for it. Like, you know what I mean? Great rock and roll. Yeah, the sneering. But, yeah. But I, he he's was a... on the cover of Rolling Stone like the 80s. Yeah. No yeah. shirt on. Yeah, he, stuff. he's pop. So he's, he's, he's punk in pop. The, he's in the story and yeah. punk music no, does I, go yeah. very pop. And that's but, cool. Yeah. You know. yeah, he was basically the Blink-182 of, of that time, of, that of the time. late seventies, when, when when the record companies were putting bands together, yeah, it's like the grunge thing. Like, oh, you're from Seattle, awesome, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So I think that's all the main players of the founding of punk music. So why don't we take a little commercial break? Let's come back and why don't we? We can just tear through the eighties and the nineties mm, and up, yeah. up okay. until the current, and then we will move on to some of our other things. And yeah, we're gonna oh, talk, awesome. Talk all about right. Henry Rollins a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Some of the other crazy characters in punk rock music. All right, we'll be back after a break. All right, we're back. So we are up to like the 1980s. Punk music in the 1980s is pretty interesting because it really breaks off into two areas. Yeah. It goes off into new wave and it goes into hardcore. And new wave is interesting because record label people started using that term to describe bands because they didn't want their artists associated with all the negative stuff that was coming with punk. And that's really bands like Blondie. In the Cars and Elvis Costello, the Talking Heads and Devo. Although Devo probably wouldn't have been a new wave band had they gotten Johnny Rotten as no, their lead awesome. singer. Yeah. Imagine him singing "Whip It" just in the in the hat. Whip the... it, damn it, <laughs> <laughs> you poser, you wanker. But the other side of the coin is hardcore music. And this point, like the punk scene moves from New York and it goes out to California. And this is where you get the rise of like the straight edge movement and yeah. all that stuff. Punk music gets. It's a lot heavier. It gets even faster. And I'll just list off a couple bands. And if you guys want to talk about a couple of them, let's, awesome. let's sure. do it. So you got bands like, and I'm sure I'm going to miss some here, but you got uh, Bad Brains, Black Flag, Husker Du, The Misfits, Minor Threat, The Dead Kennedys, The Germs, and, and Bad Religion. Wow. So many awesome bands you just named right there. Sure. Let's start with The Bad Brains. Okay, cool. Yeah, they have one of the greatest songs. It's it's called Attitude. And um one of my go to life things is you got that PMA is positive mental attitude. So they say it all through the song. Yeah, let's play a little bit of it. Love it. Like, you know what's great about Bad Bands? They started as a jazz fusion band. And these guys are like really, really talented musicians. And if you don't know who the Bad Brains are, they're a bunch of black guys. They, that's true. And they never, ever 
liked that they were considered punk rock. They didn't like the label to their thing. I don't think they are punk rock. I, yeah. No, because do the reggae too. Yeah. You know, they sold Bob Marley and they were really influenced by they they all became Rastafarians after they saw him. Then yeah. they adopted that religion. I yeah, I think maybe um a new wave of music that was coming in like Bruce was saying, not new wave, mm-hmm. but hardcore music. You gotta think about the other bands that were happening, like from bands like Fear and all the other bands that you were talking about, Bruce, that you just said. Those guys' musicianship is top of the mountain. Um, they played faster. They played more complex music than any other hardcore band that was playing at that time. And even Dave Grohl even said, if you don't know who Bad Brains are, you better start doing your homework. Yeah. And they're, they're, uh, from Washington. They're from Washington, D.C. Yeah. And they, you know, I don't feel like I'm sure they get a lot of love now. Like, like there's this beer company, D.C. Brew Company, and one of their beers is named after Bad, Bad Brains Brand song. Brains. And they're just, they're just very important. And I don't think a lot of, they get a lot of love when it comes to people remembering things. Well, like you always hear about the Ramones and this yeah. and that. I, even though we're talking about like hardcore punk now, but they're just, they're amazing. And their songs are the like chameleons, like the one song Band in DC. Yeah. That song is a chameleon. By the time that song ends, it's a completely different song. And you can really hear the musicianship. They were fucking awesome. Yeah. Like, again, they had some reggae songs also. Like on that album, from the beginning to the end, this album is awesome. But they have an instrumental reggae song called Ja Calling on there. Okay. And it's, if you ever have a chance, just listen to the first yeah, yeah. Bad Brains yeah, album. It's, it's just a great piece of American punk rock rock and roll and bad brains are a great band i can't deny that and n- more people should know about them but another not well-known band is a hardcore band called fear your local boy lee ving he is from kensington and um and in some of a couple of his songs he drops like philadelphia they're just a very important band. If you if you're a, a nerd like us, you might know who Lou Leaving is. He was in a movie called Clue. He played Mister Black in Clue, and he was in Streets of Fire and a whole bunch of other '80s movies. But he's a big personality, you know. And I'm, I'm happy to have him from Philadelphia. Like, yeah, like Fear got kicked off of Saturday Night Live. Yeah, he used to hang out with John Belushi. Yeah, well, you know, John Belushi got them on Saturday Night Live for their Halloween show. So what happened? Uh, Belushi said, well, I'll be on the show again if you book this band called Fear. They were unknown. They weren't even signed. So what happened, they they play their set and everything like that. So they come back with their second set. So th- like they say, they used to call it slam dancing, which is now called moshing. They got so out of control, they did $20,000 worth of damage Jesus to Saturday Night, Christ, Live, wow. Saturday Night Live Studios. Jesus, they probably... And Belushi was in that pit, like, caused most of the destruction. Oh, my God. You know? Can you imagine? So, he more coked out. And dude, getting, that's when that's here. when that Belushi's life was all at. But, dude, they got banned for life. Dude, yeah, I don't think they're ever going to play anywhere. In no, NBC I don't think they're ever going to No. Can we no. play some fear? Yeah. They have right. a song called I Love Living in the City. Yeah, sure. And that's the only reason why I still live in the city is because of this song. I love living in the city Like, that's a great song. But, like, another big song to us growing up was I Don't Care About You. Yeah, they... Yeah, we discovered that on that Guns N' Roses spaghetti incident. Yeah. And we listened to that song. Oh, what does he say? I'm from Philadelphia and this and that. I'm from South Street, Philadelphia. Yeah. And, like, one of, another song they have is well, Let's Call the War and Beef Bologna. But they were definitely ones with lyrics. Yeah. But their first album is just simply called The Record. Like, their record is called The Record. That's just another band that's not really, I feel, that's remembered too much. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of bands come and go, and, you know, that's why we have shows to talk about. How about we talk about the Dead Kennedys? Yeah, the Dead Kennedys, man, they're an interesting band. Incredibly political, wrote a lot of stuff. Their music is really fast. Their lead singer, Jello Biafra, kind of has had a... He's fucking awesome, that dude. He's had a kind of a second career around being like a spoken word artist he's not the most famous 
person in this whole story about punk music that becomes a spoken word artist and we'll we'll get to henry rollins in a couple minutes but um yeah he's really interesting dude let's play a little bit of hollywood or excuse me let's play a little bit of hollywood in cambodia yeah Man, those guys love the Stooges. It's it's, it's got like, like a surf sound to yeah, it almost. Yeah. And the way he sings reminds me of the guy, the singer for the Cramps, does a okay. lot of like that yeah, yeah, up and down yeah, yeah. kind of stuff. I but, don't know. but you can see their yeah, you can hear their awesome. influence. Like like I said, like they love the Stooges. Like you could totally hear that that influence in their music. Yeah. You know, I'm not like again, like I'm not the biggest fan of the Dead Kennedys, and I can't honestly no. say I I can talk educationally no, about no. their music. But yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I like him. I like him. Yeah. Jello, Jello's the man. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. I don't know a, a ton about them. Um, yeah, definitely worth mentioning. Definitely in, worth mentioning. De- definitely worth mentioning in this story. Who else you got? Another band that gets no love because I guess they weren't around very long. It was a band called the Germs. They were from L.A. and Pat Schmier was in that band. Um, guy from Nirvana. He got he got he, and he, Foo Fighters and the Foo Fighters, absolutely. But their lead singer Darby Crash, um, he was like the original hardcore guy. He died really young. If you ever seen Western Civilization Part One, he he's on the cover of it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like laying on the floor. Mm-hmm. His idea was, I have to get so fucked up that I, I, that's how I'm going to perform. Like, mm-hmm. I write my songs fucked up. I'm going to get fucked up and mm-hmm. that's how I'm going to sing my songs. So he'd get up there and just, you know, they didn't go very far. I, I guess he died young. He yeah. died really young. They said he was like, he would come up and he would, he would be singing, but he wouldn't be singing into the microphone. He didn't even well, know where the microphone was. He was so was. fucked up. You could, yeah. you could see it in the Western civilization. It's just like, he, he was just like, like you said, he's like singing in the microphone, but the microphone wasn't in front of him. He'd be laying on the floor and he couldn't get up. A very like Jim Morrison kind of thing. Like, I got to get fucked up to perform. Yeah. I hate that. I hate when people say, Oh, I got to drink before i play a gig or whatever that's bullshit he he was a really troubled guy and i guess a, a, near the end of his life he he just flat out told pat smear that he was doing shows to make enough money so he could buy enough heroin to overdose and kill himself yeah. sounds like punk rock to me and, yeah. and at his final show he told the audience like you'll never see me on stage again yeah really and then he overdosed four days later no and, kidding um, yeah. His death was largely overshadowed because he died the day before John Lennon was murdered. Really? And they yeah. say that his death is really where the hardcore scene starts to fall apart. And there's uh, always some rumor that he wrote Here Lies Darby Crash on the wall as he was dying. And as some people say that it's urban legend. No, but I'm it's sure like, did he somebody that punk rock and so heroin out and never did any heroin, I can't tell you. I doubt you could do anything like Yeah, it's uh, um let's just play a little bit from them. I don't know a whole lot yeah, about play their the music germs, either. Man. Yeah. Play the germs. Man, I knew that song. That was on one of the Tony Hawk games. Yeah. I remember that. That, yeah. that. That's actually a really good song. No, I mean, he was a really interesting guy, Darby Crash. It's a shame that he died so young. I don't even think he was like 23 years old. So he's yeah. obviously like haunted oh, an artist. He, you know. Yeah, th- he was hardcore. He Like Monday through Sunday. Who else you want to talk about on that on that list I ran through? You want to talk about uh, Black Flag a little bit? Yes, let's yeah, talk yeah. about Black yeah. Flag. Black Flag, man. Henry Rollins, Poet Laureate of love punk him. music. I love... You have the floor, sir. I love Black Flag and, and uh, Henry Rollins. Black Flag was a was a thing. They were a band that were pretty successful before Henry Rollins. Yeah, and yeah. Henry Rollins, man, he was working in a Haagen-Dazs. And... <laughs> 
was a big Black Flag fan and would go to all these shows. And at some point, they let him get up on stage and sing a song. And that led to him becoming the lead singer for Black Flag. His poetry, though, it's a little bit over my head, I got to be honest. But well, it, his, you know, I don't think that way. But um, his, he, he, he definitely has a lot of intelligent things to say. His like, book, Get in the Van, is on yeah, the yeah, story yeah. about Black Flag. That's true. Like Bruce said, he was working a nine to five job. As Henry Rollins likes to say, I was living a Bruce Springsteen. Like, <laughs> you know, I, was, I just out of high school and I was working nine to five and I went to travel, see my favorite band. And, you know, yeah, like you really have to admire the guy. He, he's, I a, do. he's a big thinker. I you know? do. And like he made it to the History Channel. He had a show on the History Channel, which I actually never seen because uh, I don't have cable. He's always been one of my favorites. Like I, if I seen him give an interview or see this or see that, I would definitely stop in my tracks and listen to every word he has yeah. to say. He has all. So I mean, this this story we've been telling has all these messed up, effed up people with drugs and dying yeah. early. And and Henry Rollins like doesn't drink. He doesn't yeah. do drugs. No, he like his vice was like working out. Sure, you know? yeah. Like, and uh, he had this just really different character in all of this that we're doing. Um, let me play a little bit of my war. That's my favorite Black Flag totally. song. Totally. Henry, he's great. He's just so angry. He's he admits intense. it. He admits yeah. it. He's like, I'm angry. I want to change the world. I want to do things my way. And don't tell me I can't do something because I can do it. He does yeah. a lot, like changing the world too. He does a lot of stuff with the USO. Oh and yeah, traveling the yeah. world. And yeah. um, if you ever go on his website too, he writes a lot of notes about places he's been and and things yeah. he sees around he visits, the world. He visits the um, soldiers that have gotten blown up basically and he talks about how goes around and tries to give these guys hope that have the half their face blown off have like it's like you think you're punk rock he's like no go through the rest of your life looking like this mm. and not be able to wipe your own ass is punk rock yeah yeah you he's know, a humanitarian that's being definitely. Yeah. that's being brave yeah it, it, i wish there's more people in the world like him the one thing that i love about henry rollins is that he's so well traveled i'm so jealous of him from it because i can never go to the places that he goes to yeah he like goes to like somewhere in like, iran and to a little tent city and will find like the alpha male and say, what do you guys need? What can I get you? You know, it may be some bars of soap. It may yeah. be some for the kids or anything, but he'll like go out and get whatever he needs. And he travels real light too. All he travels oh, yeah. is really like a backpack. I'm yeah. so, like, I'm, I, I look at him and I, I wish, I wish I could be like him so much, man. Yeah. He really is the punk rock renaissance, man. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of him. And how can, how can you I not just, be though? I love the way you know? he rolls and how he approaches yeah. everything. He's, he's just, you know, he speaks the truth. He's and a, over the years, he's just inspired me. Like you said, like, you know, you wish you could travel and do this and do that. I'm glad somebody's out there, like, taking it easy for, like, the rest of us. Like, I'm glad he's out there doing it no, for the rest need, of us. We still need somebody out there to say, fuck you. Like, no, I'm going to do it my way. Well, you gotta I'm not going to do it your way. You know, you got to be careful saying that these days. Yeah. You know, but he does it his way. Yep. And he gets through life. You know, even he goes like, oh, you don't have a girlfriend? Well, you know what? Well, fuck them too. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's his whole fucking attitude. Yeah. Yeah. He's comfortable with his shell. And he's, he's comfortable he's, who he's, he's inside. He's comfortable to be who himself. He's a huge record collector. I think he said what's one of his big vices is collecting records. Yeah. Quite a hefty movie career, doesn't he? Also, yeah, he was in like Johnny Mnemonic. He was in The Chase. Mm -hmm. He was in Sons of Anarchy. Yeah. He's been in a yeah, bunch he was, of stuff. He was a big part of seeing yeah. Sons of Anarchy. He yeah. had a, a show on IFC for a while, just a Henry Rollins show. Yeah, it was like an have, interview. Like, yeah. yeah, an interview and have a band. And yeah, so he's like, he's just always got like fifteen little projects yeah. going. He was like on yeah. the History Channel, as I said. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm I did, sure we're missing like a million other movies yeah. that he was in. I just admire the guy so much. Yeah, yeah I do too. Absolutely. I'm gonna get a tattoo. Black flag. Like black, no, just, like just Henry. Henry. Just, Henry. I love Henry, Henry, Henry with a heart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's like, Henry, we should all get him. It's like, I know you don't like people and everything like that, but I got this tattoo. Yeah, like, I wonder if Pantheon great. will uh, pay for it. We all got a Henry <laughs> Rollins tattoo. <laughs>
So who else Who else you want to talk about? I got a little bit about Bad Religion. Do you have anybody else from the 80s you want to talk about? I want to talk about one more guy that I'm going to nominate to be the shitbag of the week. Go for it. And we're talking about the one and the only Gigi Allen. The flip oh, side of, of, shit. of Henry Rollins, right? Yeah. Like, he's the he's complete a bizarro. opposite. He's the bizarro of Henry Rollins. So where, where do we start? I don't know where I to start this guy. Most people probably don't know who this dude is. He is, he is a guy that pushed the limit as far as you could possibly go with spoken word or performance art. That's a good way to put that, performance art. Yeah. yeah. He would terrorize his his audience. His whole thing was, um, I think you guys are a bunch of posers the way you live your life, yeah. and I'm the true way. He called it. himself the Messiah yeah. and yeah. all this yeah. other, like... Yeah. yeah, he was on Donahue saying, I'm going to take your children. Yeah. I'm oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I, yeah, I yeah. do I remember watched that. that. I watched that last night, and I showed some of it to my wife today. <laughs> How'd she was take like, that? How, she's like, how's your show going? And I'm like, <laughs> check this out. Uh, yeah, Gigi. Gigi, um, he's... Definitely a shit bag. He's he used been, to poop like poop on stage. Oh no, yeah. he used to throw it at people. people and yeah, they cut himself, and he'd be like, "There's a lot of pictures of him in concert. He's all covered in blood and, and shit. Yeah, yeah he's naked. Yeah, and, but you know, he's he's he had so many crimes. He committed so many crimes. He spent yeah so much time in jail. Yeah, yeah. He should have he should have been in jail for a very long time. If he yeah. wasn't dead, he'd probably be in jail. His now. brother's a real piece of work too. His yeah. brother yeah. was in that band with him. I saw like, that documentary I had on Showtime. Yeah, and I probably made it through fifteen twenty minutes where his brother starts painting pictures with his own feces. Yeah, yeah. I I you don't know. like this Merle. dude Merle. That's his name. Merle. It says Merle. Yeah, I really like GJ. Okay, I personally let's play Give one me of one his good songs. Thing. <laughs> no, we're gonna play one of his songs. Here is right here is the. Uh, I actually played this at my wedding. This is called Bite It, You Scum. was a scumbag but Dude, um his, like didn't his like his uh what do you call it his his grave is the face or this or that like his fans is like, his, like his fans go up and they piss on his grave yeah that's it they yeah. think they think you know that's like what he wanted but you know when what he did want was when he died he wanted to go out a certain way they didn't um what do you call it embalm his body yeah at all they just let it go natural really they buried him in his jock strap uh, yeah. and his um leather jacket his leather jacket that he wore on stage all the time they put headphones on him and to shut the case on him and for a piece of shit he really has a nice grave site but, he, yeah he, he really has a nice head but you can i mean you can google gg allen funeral yeah, and yeah pictures I've, of I've them seen all it. Like, they videotaped it didn't yeah they? and yeah. it's him all you know, bloated and and deteriorating, yeah, yeah. and people are posing with him and putting a cigarette in his yeah, yeah, mouth. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. really weird. It's well, bizarre. Well, when he died, he was like, he, "There's a picture of him with two girls." Yeah, they didn't. And know he's he, already dead. They didn't know. He was he dead. Know he's it's dead. like weekend at Bernie's. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, he died exactly. of a heroin overdose. Yeah. I've seen the last concert that he put on in New York City, and how he spills out into the street. Yeah, I saw that. And the only thing that he keeps on saying is, "I want to get high." I want yeah. to get high. Come on, let's go. I want to get high. And everybody's following him down the street. They're like, get away from me. You're going to get me locked up. But then the cops are coming, and then he runs like a little girl. Yeah. yeah. Well, he doesn't want to get locked up. Yeah. I mean, fuck, he's go back yeah, to jail. Yeah, but he's going to go poop on people and this and that. That's yeah. art, baby. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. It's New York, baby. It's art. You can't get arrested if it's art in New York City. But, you know, I... I the flip yeah. side, the, the absolute, the complete antithesis I can, of Henry Rollins. Yes, yeah. but I can respect Gigi for what he did. What he did was be a fucking scumbag, and scumbags like him. It's punk rock, ruined punk rock. But that's punk rock, yeah. though. I don't, I don't like. I I agree with you as much as I'm not a fan. Yeah, like he's a very, very, very important piece if you of this if puzzle he, of if, this. If you don't know who Gigi Allen is, definitely Google him. Yeah. You, he's definitely a character. There's some great documentaries out about him. Doug said there's one on Showtime. And there's a great bunch of things on YouTube that you can see on Gigi. He's a pop icon. He really is. Yeah, he's, a, he's definitely he's, been getting a lot more attention. Yeah. Well, the I last heard. Couple years. Well, I heard that they were going to make a movie of him and Christian Bale was going to be him. I can see that. That would be a great movie. 
No, then everybody's going to know who T.G. Allen yeah, is. Then they're going to make him something Christian, better than he was. It takes Christian Bale to go up there and, and shit on the floor. <laughs> know who the hell... Oh, right to the fucking Oscars. Dude, that place, that movie theater will kind of look like the Muppet Show. <laughs> like, <laughs> shit. Anyway, G.G. is the scum or the yeah, shit bag the shit of the week. But we love him, I guess. Yeah, I love so. him. I wore a shirt. I played this I jazz. Know, I, know. I played this jazz gig one time, and um, I wore a G.G. Allen shirt, and I wore a jean jacket on top of it. And I'm playing the swing music and everything like that, and some dude comes up to me, and he's like, do you got a Gigi Allen shirt on? I'm like, yes, I do. He's like, you're playing in a jazz band. You got a Gigi Allen shirt on. I'm like, I'm punk rock, baby. My daughter and I were playing rock band the other night, and uh, you can custom, you know, you make your character customized, and you're going through all the facial hair options, and one of them said the Gigi. Oh, really? And I was like, that the, little hair, the little weird, yeah, the, the little weird mustache. And I said to my daughter, dude. I was like, do you know who that is? I'm like, please tell me you don't know who yeah, that is. And if you do, you're, you're right, right. I didn't want to hear the punish. answer. Right. <laughs> no, and she was like, she's like, isn't that the guy that would like throw shit at people? people. <laughs> yeah. So she's heard of him. Yeah. One more thing about Gigi, which is really interesting. I saw in his documentary, you know, who was a fan of Gigi? Who? John Wade Gacy. No. He uh, has, yeah. He, that he, doesn't surprise yeah. me. Totally. So. Gigi went and went and saw John Wayne Gacy in jail. Did he really? Yeah. He went and visited him in there. And John Wayne Gacy, you know, he's a fucking serial killer. Right. Killed and, kill children. Children, right? Yeah. And he's in the same room with Gigi. And he's like, huh, I love this guy. But, man, you were the worst smelling hobo I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Who said that? Did he say that? Did John Wayne Gacy say that, that to him? He said he's the worst. He said smelling. that was probably the greatest compliment I ever he's got like, in my he's, life. He's like, he's the worst smelling hobo I ever smelled in my life. That's crazy. And here's John Wayne Gacy. Like, how do you have a friendship? Here I am, Gigi Allen, and the only person that wants to hang out with me is a serial killer. Yeah. That just sums uh, it all up. Let's move on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I need a shower after that. Talk about one. Bad Religion a little bit? Yeah, let's, let's love maybe yeah. the, Maybe we'll close out the 80s with them. So bad Religion's an interesting band because people say either they destroyed punk music or they saved punk music. I don't think they're either or. So punk music by now, a lot of the shows, fights were breaking out. The California music scene, people were like suicidal tendencies who we haven't spoken about. Yeah, people no. people yeah, thought awesome. they were like in a gang because the way Mike Muir mm-hmm. wore like the headbands on his yeah. head. Or a lot of the, those bands that were trying to get heavier were turning into like thrash metal. And Bad Religion's first gig was actually opening for Social Distortion, who is my favorite punk band of all and time. And mine and also. Dogs. People started hating on Bad Religion because they said that their music was too soft compared to the trend in hardcore music. And they, they broke up in 85. They get back a little bit later and they decide they really, really want to go back to their punk rock m- roots. And what I always like them makes them different is they use a lot of three-part harmonies. Yeah. Yeah. In a lot of their songs. There's a couple interesting things about Bad Religion. The first one is they came out with an album, Suffer, and it didn't do real well on the charts, but it's considered one of the most influential punk rock albums. You hear the offspring talk about it a lot. You hear about the dude from NoFX, Fat Mike, talk about it a lot. Fat Mike said he listened to it 10 times the first night it ever came out. The real big contribution is their lead guitarist started Epitaph Records. And he used that to release Bad Religion records. And as Bad Religion records started to sell more, they took the money, they dumped it back into Epitaph to sign more bands. So they signed L7, No Effects, The Offspring, and Rancid. Wow. And the lead singer of Bad Religion, Greg Gaffin, Graffin, has a PhD in zoology. So he teaches classes at like Cornell and UCLA. <laughs> I would love to have him as one of my college professors sure sure so i'll play i'll play a little bit of los angeles is burning i said they're 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 one of my favorites I don't think that they they ruined punk, and I don't think they saved punk. Or I think they made punk a little bit more pop, maybe yeah. a little bit more friendly yeah, yeah, for people yeah. to 
listen yeah. to it in the mall. Yeah, they play. They pay the way they Blink One Eighty Two and I, all that. Yeah, I think people say they saved it just for what they did with Epitaph Records and the, sure with all those bands. They signed independent yeah. label. Well, if yeah. anything, what they did was they kept punk alive yeah. through the eighties. They signed Rancid, dude, which is a great band. Like I don't know if we'll have time to talk about Rancid, but yeah. um, and, and Epitaph is, I think, the most successful independent record label of all time, too. Mm-hmm. So, and I know the Offspring's album is the most successful independently released album of all time wow. so, yeah that was a big so album. they've had a they've had a big yeah, that was a, a big, big album influence. and maybe one more thing to wrap up on the 80s and we'll we could tear through the 90s real fast sure. it's just kind of the influence that mtv has the first punk rock video that mtv played was punk rock girl by the dead milkman another philadelphia yeah, band. yeah i remember yeah. them yeah and, and i remember was, that video yeah you know, it was just kind they of were, quirky weird deal. yeah but but again mtv starts playing it yeah. and it really helped pull that music into the mainstream did that have something to do with punk rock music but, going pop maybe i don't but what know what do you really call like the dead milkman like a new wave they're, they're, kind of band like they're like, quirky they're like a yeah they were kind of heavier quirky. They're weird version boy band. of like the violent femmes to yeah me. yeah they're and that's new wave i but, guess you know yeah. maybe just because they had punk rock girl, girl in it it yeah. was the title that was yeah. Playing, oh yeah there's this thing about punk all rock. that yeah yeah so let's move over into the 90s that's really where punk rock music Really got it, gets, it gets commercial and it, it gets huge. I mean, we're, we're 20 years after the Ramones come out and where the Ramones were really not selling a lot of records. And then you have some of these bands that are selling more than 20 million albums. One band that came out of the nineties that, that Doug and I really like is Social Distortion. Yo, I like them too, dude. Oh, oh my bad. All right. So I, may not, I, I may not have a tattoo of Social Distortion, yeah. but like both of you both have a Social Distortion tattoo. So I'm not in the club. Mike Ness is Mike Ness is fucking awesome. Mike Ness will get in fights at a show with like Nazi like yeah. skinheads. Another and and that. another interesting guy yeah. in this that he um he's into like boxing, he does like car restoration yeah. and stuff like that. He really plays that whole like gr- old greaser. greaser. Oh, they're yeah. really into like old music. I mean he No, it's like rockabilly punk. It's yeah. like a Billy, you know, it's they were covering Johnny Cash and you know what? And now that I thought I just think about that. There is a point in Johnny Cash's career where Johnny Cash isn't cool anymore. Yeah. And where he goes or where his music goes is in the punk music. Absolutely. Punk yeah. music always embraced him. And I remember reading some interview with Mike Ness and he was just like, homie, Johnny Cash has never not been cool. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. it's like when people were kind of frowning on him yeah. and, and, stuff and like, like that. You know, like social distortion kept that, that music alive and like introduced, I don't know if it introduced it to me back in 90, when, like, I, I guess it was like 95. I, I, I got into social distortion. But um, they're just a great, simple rock and roll band. And I think if I ever had the perfect band to go be in, Social Distortion would Mike definitely Ness, be it. Mike Ness, his writings are amazing. It's like poetry. I always said Mike Ness's writing is like a leather rose petal. That's very good. You know what I mean? That's like very good. A leather rose. Like one song that I always relate to, especially like in the bar business, and I say it all the time, and now I have you know, other people saying it, like I'm chasing nickels and dimes. You know, there's truth yeah. in that, like in the world that we live in, you know, and going back into it eventually, do I really want to go back to his life chasing nickels and dimes? Because, yeah. you know, it's, it's so very relevant. Bruce, you know? what do you think of uh, Social D? The album White Light, White Heat, White Trash, to me, has gotten me through a lot of bad times same, in my same, life. Same. When I'm, when I'm feeling crappy, I put that on and I just, I just feel better. That was my first introduction that album to Social Distortion, but my favorite album is Sex, Love, and Rock and Roll. Highway 101 is kind of like my theme song at times. Uh, Can you just play a second of that? Like I listen to that song, there's like a, a scene going on in my mind, you know. Yeah, but it's like I just wish. Like I'm glad that band's not super popular. I know people like heard them and this and that, but it's like that's that's my band, Bruce. That's yeah. your band. Like I don't want it to be like super popular. Yeah, you know. No, and, and they're. Uh, I think this is the f- because of the pandemic last year. 2020 was the first year. I think in like 12 years. I haven't. I didn't see them. Yeah, you know, they come around every year, and I I go every year. So what, they're just they're just again they're great. In my band. personal opinion. 
they're one of the most important rock and roll bands in America. Yeah. You know? And again, I should have put them in my top six, but you know, I don't know why yeah. I didn't. I like Story of My Life. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, I do too. that's my favorite one. Yeah. Their cover of Ring of Fire. Yeah. Is, of yeah. course, yeah. is great. Mommy's Little Monster. Mommy's Little Monster. Yeah. Just a lot of stuff. And their early stuff is more like rockabilly kind of yeah. sound. Ball and yeah. Chain. Yeah. 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 Ball and Chain's a great song. So if you don't know anything about social distortion, pick some up. Absolutely. Some other bands in the nineties. Let's let's take a look. Operation Ivy, just mention them real yeah, quick. Yeah, that was with uh the Rancid was before Tim Armstrong yeah. and Matt Freeman. They went on to create Rancid. And um, and I again Rancid is another important, very, 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 very important band. Yeah. And I I didn't write any notes down about Rancid other than yeah, that they're really. that they were around and they're still around and Hey Hey man, I saw them play with the misfits at mass square garden for their fair world tour and they were the best part of the show yeah they were rocking they were better than the misfits they were 10 times better than the Misfits. yeah i'm sure and they did the whole they did the majority of outcome the wolves album oh, wow. and if you don't know anything about rancid and you want to know or learn more about rancid listen to outcome the wolves but what's really funny is that no effects in rancid rancid did a no effects album a really popular no effects album no effects to a out come the wolves in like, their own way. Like they covered each, they other's, covered each other's albums. Huh. It's really good. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. Maybe, maybe talk about no effects a little bit too. I, I don't listen to a whole lot of their music. They're, they, they're a bunch of clowns. Yeah. You know, they, I think that's done, why I don't like them. Yeah. Fat Mike's, he's a real, he's a real jerk. They've you know? done a lot of albums, but they're also not on a major record label. No, because they suck. They've, they sold, uh, no, they, I wouldn't say they suck. You know, they're, they just, they had their own thing. They don't, why they don't need to be on a record deal. They're, they're, you know? They're a very successful independent yeah. band. Uh, Punk and Drublick, the album that went platinum. Yeah. Uh, Fat Mike also has a, a record label, Fat Records, that has put out 157 albums. And there was a lot of bands on here that I knew, like The Descendants, uh, Rise Against, Lesson Jake, mm. Against Me, Lesson Lag Jake Wagon. Yeah. And then he has that side project, Me First and the Gimme Gimmies. That's a great band that also. That they only do covers. They yeah. Do, like, they're really a great weird, band. And they're always like in the... The, yeah. the album covers are in like lounge suits and crap like that. They had a show on on the uh, A&E. I, was that show that Henry Rollins was on, that, that show that he had? IFC? Held. They had an IFC show, and it was them traveling through Europe. They were like in their 40s, and they're still going like they were like in their 20s. Like those guys kind of live that punk rock lifestyle, even though they have like – well, Fat Mike definitely has a lot of cash. I just don't like their version of punk. Rock. Yeah, I, I get. Yeah. They're a bunch of clowns. They're a bunch of jerks. They're a bunch of clowns uh, that write pop punk songs. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's catchy. You know, yeah, I mean, but they're worth mentioning. They never know? got too big, thank God. I didn't yeah, know. but no, they have a big following. They have a really big. Yeah, following. they're underground pretty well. Yeah, and that's fine. But they're they're, they're worth talking about. Yeah, and I guess the last. The last punk band, unless you guys got something else, is the holy trinity of 90s punk music, which is Green Day, The Offspring, and Blink-182. Let's talk about Green Day. Okay. They're, yeah. They're, they automatically got in the Rock and Roll of Fame, which is amazing. I think they're a great band. Yeah. It's a shame that, that they take a lot of shit for being the sellouts that, new, they, that they were. Oh, I'm sorry. They just put... a. Broadway play out. They had that. They had yeah, but like for calling them a sellout is a bunch of bullshit. No, dude. I'm with. You. They worked really hard to get where they're at. Like to me, dude, when Nathan came out, they were not punk rock. I was already listening to the Ramones. I was listening yeah. to the Sex Pistols. Yeah, I remember you saying that you weren't like, and really in there. I got that Dookie album. I was like, this is a pop album. Yeah, this sounds too well produced to be a punk album. But it was great though. I became more of a fan of what Green Day became. Like afterwards. Afterwards, like I love American Idiot. Yeah, it's a great album. That's a great album. Everything about that album's great. I'm not really into them, but I can acknowledge a great album when I when I hear one. But they take a lot of shit for, because they were the first ones to uh, break into the scene. They made the scene again in the 90s. And then you know what? You had other fans following them in more watered down punk rock bands, and I was insulted that they were even called punk rock bands, like Blink-182. All right, Dude Ranch is a great album. That's the album that really introduced me to them. And I, I was a huge, I was a big Blink-182 fan. You know, like, who I, I know you weren't, but I was. Like, it was, it was not the like then, you know? Uh, yeah, but it was like, you know, they were great 
MTV band. They do have one of the best drummers in their band, Travis Barker. He is hands down. Like, I know the band's this and that, but that guy's a monster on the drums. And he ain't got a good band unless you got a good, good drummer. drummer. <laughs> That's right. It's just too Hollywood, man. It's yeah, just he too... became a celebrity. Yeah, he's, he's a personality. Even... You know, he did a lot of cool stuff and a lot of not cool stuff. You I know? personally like Blink-182 before he was in the band. Yeah. Once, Travis no, Parker so became, once Travis Parker became part of Blink-182, that's when I start jumping up. Because they were became all the... Like all like MTV, a, MTV, and just stuff, man. I can't say the f word anymore. I'm not allowed. <laughs> it's the only thing I can think of is the f yeah, word yeah. Is, <laughs> is to to think about Blink 182. Yeah, but you know they hey they made their mark. Everybody knows who they are. Yeah. Another thing we didn't mention when punk rock was going pop was the uh, introduction and evolution of the Warp Tour. The Warp yeah, Tour, sure, sure. the Warp yeah, yeah, Tour yeah. started yeah. and and really brought it. And you had the rise of like. The X Games and yeah. a couple times we were oh, talking the, about some of these the these X bands games. and like um be it the, the like the song from Death being on Tony Hawk yeah. soundtrack like a lot of that stuff all brought punk rock kind of more into the mainstream too yeah but that was a big scene though Warp Tour went for dude over a decade no, it was, it was totally, over, around for a yeah. decade at least and like the X Games was very yeah big still they're still yeah. around right I, I, I think when, dude the first two years of X Games was in Philadelphia they had yeah, a contract. That, we it had three awesome. passes that thing. It was great. We go just take a walk and go see. Yeah, this. we went every day. Yeah, cool. So like punk rock one hundred and one guys. There so, you go. So would you say punk rock still lives, or do you think it needs to be a rebirth in two thousand twenty one? Or what? I think there's a kid out there right now listening to the Clash and to the Ramones, and thinking about what kind of music he's going to listen to for the rest of his life yeah it changed the world i mean there's there's so many movements in music that have such a huge change and you think about it it's coming it starts 10 years after the hippie movement you know it's just like you gotta think about that dude yeah. everybody got tired of peace and love man yeah. everybody was angry in the 70s everybody was well you know what it was it was yeah. disco that pissed everybody off and yeah. that's when punk came out a lot of a lot of really good music i this was cool because i learned a lot about a lot of musicians i got exposed to a lot of music i didn't know a whole lot about so I, it was it was an enjoyable experience yeah. for me i got to revisit a lot of things from like my youth that i forgot about and then uh, that I haven't listened to in a very long time. And and I watched a video about a guy who throws poop at people. I sure. Mean, yeah. You know, it's just like. I had a blast the last two weeks doing all my research. It really took me back to memory lane. Yeah. yeah. It was fun. And it's fun. I'm, and I'm, you know, bringing up Pantheon again. I'm glad this was our first episode to introduce, introduce everybody to us. Yeah. You know? I agree. All right. So that's that's about it with punk rock. Why don't we do some listener feedback and then let's do the electric chair and we'll wrap up and we'll call it a night. Guys, I got an email from our friend Omar. Oh, that's awesome. Omar's from India, people. He listens to our podcast and gets in touch with us. He says, hello, fellow inmates. It's your good friend Omar from Kapur, India. I've been enjoying your latest episode about 1991. Your playlist song from 1991's That Suck was truly hysterical. <laughs> CNC Music Factory still has a strong following in India. There are only a few rockers like myself. Let me congratulate you becoming a part of Pathion Podcast. I am already a fan of Rock and Roll Archaeology and many other podcasts that host. Having the Prisoner of Rock and Roll on Pathion Podcast makes it easier for me to spread the word about your wonderful show. Along with Rob Owens, we will make the Prisoner of Rock and Roll the number one show on Pathion. Recently, I've been listening to a lot of blues guitar. Stevie Ray Vaughan was the greatest. A show about him or other guitar gods would be educational. Just wanted to say hi and good luck with Pathion Podcast. Keep on rocking, Omar. Thanks, Thank Omar. Thank you, Omar. And that's a great suggestion, too. Yeah, that's a good. That's yeah. pretty yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. We'll put that down on our list of notes. We got pages and pages of show ideas. Yeah, Omar. We love hearing from you. Uh, we'll tell Rob you said hello. Yeah, definitely, man. Thanks. Thanks for writing in and good to hear from you again. So, the electric chair. So, those of you who are new listeners, we pick one song. And we send to the electric chair, since we are the prisoners of rock and roll, where we sentence it to death. We take turns. This week, it is mine. And my selection is We Built This City by Starship. Oh, how could they even be Jefferson Airplane? Dude? They. This was considered the we worst song ever written. I, I agree. By Rolling Stone <laughs> by Magazine. Rolling Stone by Magazine. Rolling Stone Magazine. Yeah, man. How, how you went from Volunteers and White Rabbit and Great yeah. Slick to this. Whoa. Come on, it's, man! This is the eighties. It was a successful song, though, wasn't it? 
it, it was. It was totally. It's huge. It's just, into this, song. this just sums up crappy 80s. Ugh. Yeah, the synthesizers. And knowing where it came from, the Jefferson yeah. Airplane. It's it 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 a song they did for Madigan. No, no, that's the other voice. What was that song? Oh. All right, kill the nurse. Yeah. We sentence you to death. Yeah! yeah. Never. Yeah, never again. <laughs> never have to hear that song ever again. My gosh. Woo! That's bad. I, I, I had like an epiphany. I just like, <laughs> I thought of that. I was like laying in bed and I like, I shot off the bed. I'm like, I have to go to my notebook and write this down right now. So that's it, everybody, man. Thanks for, thanks for joining with us. We hope you learned something. We hope you were entertained. We hope you go out and check out some of this music we played, man. We, we published playlists of all this music that we, we play, we published playlists of all this music that we talk about. And there's a lot of stuff we didn't get to, man. There's, there's yeah. a lot of other bands that yeah. were in our notes and we just didn't have the time. We'd be here all night. Do so your, if there's a song that you, or a band that we missed, let us know. Absolutely. Yeah, do your own research and let us know about what you know. Yeah, man, you can absolutely get in touch with us. You can check us out. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter at Prisoners of Rock. You can also find us on the Pantheon Podcast Network, which will then have us on every major platform where you listen to your favorite podcast. And uh, that's it, man. We'll talk to everybody in two weeks. Peace. As I like to say, keep on rocking. Peace out. <laughs>